Daniel Key's style in Flowers for Algernon. As it says here, there's only 13 things, and even those were a bit of a stretch. Um, and you'll see that most of them are just things that I've drawn from my master's degree in TESOL, which was basically learning linguistics. Um, and so, in essence, what I'm doing is telling you better words than saying, he writes dumb, then he writes smart, then he writes dumb again at the end. So, keep that in mind as I'm giving you these phrases. Uh, just knowing basically what they simply mean will be more than enough. So the first thing is epistolary style, which is basically just a text that is made up of lots of different texts. So in this case, it's a progress report. And obviously, that in itself is a very interesting device and a very interesting choice to have the documents actually presented. So then what I want you to do is actually finish off the sentence that I've given you here and actually put that into a sentence explaining why you think the author did that. So start with key selected an, ep an epistolary style, not and, so that, uh, and then tell me what you think his purpose was in doing so. So Charlie's argotic expression, argotic just means unique or unique to a field. So you might, the most common expression is thieves argot, which means that thieves speak in a particular way. The sentence to get you started is Keyes gives Charlie Gordon a notable, notably argotic ex expression because he, and then we're looking for an authorial intent continuation there. Third one, use of morphological errors, which basically means the wrong word. Morphology is the structure or choice of a word. Uh, so typically the morphological errors take the form of misassigned homophones. So um, uh, he, a homophone is something that sounds the same, so he's putting the wrong word because it sounds correct, because his spelling is uh, based entirely on sounds rather than word recognition. So finish this off. In his earlier progress reports, Charlie's writing is full of morphological errors. Key's elected to do so because, why do you think he chose to do so? Phonemic ortho orthography. So <laughs> phoneme is a sound, the sound that a word makes. Orthography is the way that something is written or a style of writing. So basically it means written like it sounds or spelt like it sounds. For example, thought instead of thought. Finish this off. Charlie's phonemic orthography shows his something, something, something because Keyes intends. Okay, five is sentence complexity. Basically there's three basic forms of sentences. Simple, compound and complex. Simple is one concept. Compound is two. Complex is three or more. So. Simple sentences whilst dumb, and later compound and complex sentences when smart. So multiple clauses, multiple ideas. So, for example, what you want to say is towards the end of the epistolary novel, Charlie's writing shows increased sentence complexity. Key aims to, okay, jumping from five to seven, as, as we do in maths, uh, double negation. So using two negative words, for example, I don't done nothing, which is actually triple negation. Uh, Gordon's use of double negation make it, makes it clear that and Keyes intends for us to. This one's quite general and always useful, I guess. Um, present simple tense, first person. So this, the writing is in the simplest possible tense, the present simple tense, as opposed to, for example, future per perfect tense. Basically, he just says what he's gonna do and he's very clear about it. The correct phrase for that is present simple tense or simply first person point of view. So finish this off, Charlie maintains present simple tense so that it's always clear that, and Keyes uses this strategy. So this is the least impressive sounding one, but lacking punctuation. So simply, Charlie Gordon's writing is bereft of punctuation. Bereft just means completely absent of punctuation because this is something beyond his level of comprehension. Keyes makes this explicitly clear to the reader because... 10 intertextual references is a really expansive one. You can really prepare for quite well. Uh, and these only emerge whilst Charlie is intelligent. intelligent. He references increasingly complex texts that have significance for his mental state at that time. So during his peak intelligence, Keyes has Charlie referred to a range of intertexts such as something, something, something to suggest that religious imagery, uh, the religious elements of the text are very clear and draw very neat parallels with Gattaca. So that's why this is quite easy to reference. Uh, like say, you mentioned the rosary beads that hang from the rearview mirror during Gattaca, then you can quite easily say, similarly, in Flowers for Algernon, the Garden of Eden is alluded to, or something similar to that. So Key uses religious imagery to provide a moralistic element to the text, suggesting that 
and a better sentence would actually reference the thing that he's referring to. So it could be um, when the woman, the religious woman, tells him that he's doing the wrong thing. All right, so this is easy mode. Um, this is something I very rarely teach to classes because it's just so easy, I presume people understand it. But you can simply refer to motifs and symbols, and that's quite easy and simple to do. So to do that, all you need to do is refer to any of the little pictures that we annotated in the text as we read it, or that you annotated in your own. For example, superstition, Superman, mazes, cages, Algernon himself or itself, for example. So key uses the motif of, pick whatever you want, to suggest, show, reveal, infer, clarify the idea that, blah, blah, blah. Last one, allusions. Uh, intertextual references name the text, whereas allusion just references it. Uh, so for example, Key uses the uses allusions to Icarus, Jesus' portrayal of the Garden of Eden with the intention that, finish that off, what's his purpose?